por aquí han pasado eh, grandes expositores nacionales y extranjeros. Tratamos de invitar a, la, a los científicos que mejor entienden las diferentes pesquerías, no solamente la de la anchoveta, porque muchas veces eh, hay especies relacionadas con la anchoveta que impactan sobre esa biomasa. Y es bueno entender también el, el entorno de la anchoveta. Otras veces no hablamos de cardúmenes, hablamos del mar, hablamos de las condiciones oceanográficas o hablamos de la, de la cadena ictiológica. En fin, tratamos de hacer una visión bastante holística del problema eh, que nos concierne, que es la sostenibilidad de la anchoveta. En esta oportunidad hemos invitado al doctor Rohan Curry, eh, es un especialista de la MSC y nos va a discernir en esta ocasión una conferencia que es el qué rol eh, juega el MSC, el Marine Stewardship Council, para los que no conocen el, el, digamos el, el, esta organización, es una organización a nivel internacional, mundial, que establece ciertos estándares para, para que diferentes especies eh, puedan ser comercializadas y cuidan toda una cadena de procesos que comienza desde la captura hasta la comercialización del producto. Él va a ser un poco más específico probablemente en la explicación, pero más o menos de eso trata. Esta, esta organización finalmente certifica a las pesquerías el, el, el buen trato tanto de la captura, cuidando obviamente la sostenibilidad, y también cuida el trayecto logístico hasta el momento de su comercialización. El doctor Rohan Curry, estoy seguro que va a satisfacer las inquietudes que ustedes tengan. Estoy convencido que va a ser una conferencia muy interesante para todas las personas eh, como ustedes, eh, científicos, académicos y periodistas que suelen asistir a, a escuchar este tipo de conferencias. Nuevamente, muchas gracias por venir, eh, gracias por acompañarnos y démosle con la bienvenida al doctor Ron Curry con un fuerte aplauso. The topic of my talk is the role of science in the MSC fisheries standard. I'll be taking you through a number of different steps through the presentation. I'll first I'll give you an introduction to the MSC for those that are not so familiar with it. Then I will cover the science of the MSC fisheries. Teaming with life today and tomorrow and for future generations to come. 
group is to make sure that the oceans are, are healthy for everyone. The way our program works is by two components, certification of fisheries and eco-labeling of the product that is then able to be sold from those fisheries. So this is in effect a mechanism for recognising and rewarding sustainable fishing practices while incentivising improvements when needed. A central part of this is the fact that MSC recognises many fisheries around the world are presently sustainable, but some may need to make improvements in order for them to be able to reach a standard. So there needs to be an incentive, there needs to be a reward for getting engaged in trying to work to improve your fishing practices. And the mechanism that the MSC has come up with, which is, is in common to many voluntary certification schemes around the world in other areas, is a notion of a theory of change. This is trying to work out, out a way of creating incentives for people to improve, to do the right thing, and to get recognition for doing the right thing. In the case of the MSC, what that means is that the mechanism involves fisheries seeking certification, and then retailers choosing to select that certified seafood, and having a traceable supply chain to ensure that the fish comes from those fisheries that have made those, those improvements. And then the hope is that consumers preferentially select the labelled product. So that consumers then drive the desire for those fisheries and those supply chains to ensure the product is sustainable. <coughs> Over time, the market demand increases and that then results in more fisheries choosing to improve. It's this virtuous cycle we're trying to ensure that fisheries over time improve because they get recognised for their improvements and then others see that benefit too and, and they desire to make those improvements. As I mentioned, MSC has been around 20 years. So we, the process and the, the events that unfolded over the last 20 years are highlighted here. But I just want to point out a couple of big ones. The collapse of the Grand Banks cod fishery was probably the biggest single event that triggered the formation of the MSC. And it led to an unusual partnership. It led to one of the world's largest fish con producer organisations and, con and product um, retail organisations, linking with one of the world's largest NGOs. So WWF and Unilever came together to form the MSC to address this problem. Even although they had quite different philosophies as to what they wanted to do, they had a, they had a common interest in having sustainable seafood um, long term. In the case of Unilever, they wanted to be able to continue to sell their products. In the case of WWF, they wanted to see healthy oceans. So between the two, they recognised that a market mechanism could be quite an important, an important thing to develop. <coughs> And over time, we've seen the program progress. Um, as, as recently as, as 2008, 100 fisheries were now certified <coughs> for an assessment. Um, McDonald's identified that they were going to use the label. Um, IKEA decided to. A number of large organisations started coming on board as they recognised the importance of this way of trying to improve the oceans and ensure that the seafood supply they were selling was sustainable. Where we're at now, the MSC now in, in 2018 has, has about 200 staff now and about 15 officers covering about 30 different countries. And this reflects the fact that the program has been quite successful in encouraging fisheries to come forward and seek certification. We are independent now from the WWF and Unilever that established us. They've now left, left us to our, our own path. But we are very, very heavily guided by a very strong governance structure, which relies on having a technical advisory board of eminent scientists and a stakeholder advisory council of stakeholders representing NGOs, industry, retail, governments, and they then advise our board of trustees. Collectively, this group then means that we really are trying to reflect the interests of all stakeholders in what constitutes sustainability. 
our third party certification system means that the MEC itself doesn't make the certification decisions. We have independent conformity assessment bodies. These are the experts that are asked to go out and conduct the fishery assessments with assessment teams. They send these experts out, they produce the reports, the stakeholders provide feedback, and then eventually fisheries can be certified if they meet our standard. And at the moment, the MEC is the global leading eco-label for wild fish. I'll just highlight where we're at when we come to the overall volume. But when we come to the role of science, what, do, what does the MEC have in terms of a, a scientific capacity? Uh, we now have about 35 staff in our science and standards team. So these are the people responsible for looking after the fisheries standard. Um, members of my team, the fisheries team, oversee the fisheries standard, but we also have a chain of custody standard. We have a research team that's dedicated to, to understanding cutting edge techniques and how they might be incorporated or addressed. Um, we have a, a team that is devoted to understanding the impact of fisheries and, and how to work with fisheries in the developing world. Um, these teams work together, with many of them with PhDs and a, and a background in scientific endeavours, to make sure that our science is based on robust scientific evidence. Um, our new director, recently appointed, um, is Professor um, Michael Kaiser, who is a former professor at Banyan University in Wales in the UK has just recently started with our organisation. His particular ex expertise was benthic and habitat impacts. He brings a wealth of experience. The picture here, Francis, is, leads our research team. He studied demersal trawl species. Um, so we, and from these scientists, what we're producing is a series of publications and, and research collaborations. So we're an active research group in our own right, in addition to the work that goes on with our staff. And where has all this led? What it's led to of recent times is, uh, as I mentioned, in about 2008, so about 10 years ago, there were 100 fisheries in the program. We now have something like 300, nearly 350 program uh, fisheries are certified. And that equates to now about 14% of global wild caught seafood, which reflects a significant proportion of the market. And in, in the particular product classes, it's now become common that many fisheries require MSC certification in order to be able to sell their products in certain markets. So it's become an important driver for those fisheries seeking to make sure that they can demonstrate their sustainability. Here's just the way that this has progressed over time. You can see the, the growth in the fisheries leading up to this. But also the other thing is the number of products that are now in the market has, has escalated and continued to grow at quite a rapid rate too. We now have over 28,000 separate products available in the marketplace. I, I asked Christian and, and Rodrigo for some up, updated information about what's happening here in Latin America and apparently now there are 13 fisheries that have been certified in, in Latin America. Most recently the Chilean um, krill fishery that was, that was certified just, just quite relatively recently. You also have four um, full assessments that are currently in progress um, and probably the big, and big one at the moment is the Chilean jack mackerel fishery which is near in completion. I mentioned in addition to our fishery standard we also have a chain of custody standard. This is how we demonstrate that and track the products through the supply chain so that people can have confidence when they buy labelled products that it actually comes from a sustainable source. Our chain of custody standard is, is sort of summarised here. It includes these five principles. And it's about ensuring that the product is identified, segregated, traceable, and making sure that you can trust where it comes from. And to, to validate that, to assess that, we have we undertake um, research and perform DNA testing. This DNA testing has been done to form, to conduct tracebacks to identify where the product comes from in the supply chain. And at, the, at present, in our most recent testing, 99.6% of the product actually came for, from the correctly labelled original source, which is encouraging. 
means that consumers, when they buy and see like products, can have confidence where they're coming from. I think the final thing that I'd, I'd like to highlight as a, as a bit of a, a, a big overarching topic that we need to consider um, is the AICI targets and the sustainable development goals that the UN has, has recently put in place. This is something that's quite fundamental as a broader reason for why the MSC does what it does. Um, working to try to improve ocean sustainability was identified as a, a, an important priority by the UN. This is a topic that is a, a high priority for many world leaders. So because of that, the MSC has been heavily engaged in this. Our Chief Executive has attended the UN meetings and addressed them to, to be involved in this particular work. And it now turns out that actually seeking MSC certification and becoming certified, that's now regarded as an indicator of performance under SDG 14, which relates to life in the water. So I think that's it's quite important to see that people are now recognising that seeking certification and proving and demonstrating that to the world, that's a way of actually ensuring that the oceans are in the world. So with that, that provides a general form of background as to what the MSC is and how we see ourselves fitting into to the world. In terms of how science underpins the MSC fisheries standard, for those that aren't familiar, our fisheries standard has three key principles. We talk about the need for sustainable fish stocks, that the stocks are evaluated, they have a robust harvest strategy, and it's, it's, demo it's demonstrated to be effective and responsive to the way that the stock changes. We also focus on minimising environmental impact. And there are many ways that we need to be careful about the, the fisheries impact on the environment. For those that were involved, this was the topic of a, of a recent workshop we held here over the past few days in this work. Um, and here we're looking at things like the impact on bycatch species, the primary species, which might be something that you're targeting that isn't yet something that you wish to see an eco for. The secondary species, which might be something that you need to minimise your bycatch of. The impact on endangered, threatened or protected species, where we're very keen to see those populations recover to their former levels. Impacts on habitats where we, we need to see that the impacts on events those aren't going to have a major disturbance effect that a, that a habitat can't recover from. And finally, the overall impact on the ecosystem to, to factor in how these separate components come together and the system itself, how it responds. Then we have principle three. And here we're assessing the fisheries management system. This is ensuring that it has the appropriate policy frameworks and regulations, things like that in place. But then finally we also drill down and say, what is the individual fishery? How are they performing? Do they have the appropriate monitoring, control, surveillance, observer programs? Um, what are they doing to ensure that we can have confidence that the data they're collecting is representative of their fishery? So these are the separate components that combine and make up the MSC fishery standard. And it's got to this point evolving over the last 20 years to reflect new science and best practice where it's widely adopted. So our standard setting relies on several different things and it's compliant with several different organisations. The ICL Alliance is a body that governs standard setters and effectively sets out what best practice is if you're trying to write a standard. And, for, and we are compliant there against all three of ICL's codes, including its standard setting code. The FAO, the Guidelines for Eco-Labeling of Fish and Fishery Products for Wild Catch of Fisheries, was one of, it was one of the fundamental documents that underpinned the original development of the MSC standard. And since then, the Global Sustainable Seafood Initiative has come along as a means of benchmarking the performance of the standard against the FAO code and we have recently been benchmarked against that. We passed all the essential criteria, and I believe over 60 of the optional criteria as well. So we were picking up a number of different things that many other fisheries and um, certification approaches may not necessarily reflect. 
Finally, the way that we go about our standards is this is the process of love since we find it. We are compliant with all of the ISO requirements, and this is about ensuring that our standard setting is robust. People can have confidence in it. People can trust its impartiality in the way that decisions are made. How do we then actually incorporate, given all of that background, how do we actually change our standard? How does it, how does it move? Where, how do we reflect this new information? When new science comes along, how does it get incorporated? It's, it's an iterative process. Our standard doesn't change very often. And we only are required under ICU requirements to review it every five years. We don't want to do it too often because fisheries need time to adapt. They need to understand what they're aiming for and they need to be able to work towards that and make necessary changes. But from the moment we release a new standard, little issues will crop up. Or people will have opinions and thoughts as to where improvements could be made. So we note all of those. And then we start doing the research to understand whether those issues need to be addressed, and if so, how. And this process then goes on for quite some time. There's research and development, stakeholder consultation, um, and we then use the, the governance bodies I mentioned earlier, our technical advisory board, and our board of trustees. We rely on them for advice to, and our stakeholder council to make sure that we understand what people think about these, whether it is based on robust science. And then finally, our board of trustees can make a final decision on the changes, and then we evaluate that to make sure the changes are delivering and maintaining the outcome. So it's a, it's a policy development process that probably resembles what governments do. And in fact, it probably reflects the scale of the MSC program now that we are very careful with this because with so many fisheries in the program, a big change here has a big effect on the water. So we want to make sure these changes are well understood, they're tested before they're introduced. And that brings me to, uh, if you like, part of our, our guiding principles when we come to evaluating whether we're likely to introduce a policy. We look for whether there is new science or emerging best practice, but then what we also do is we ask the question, has this research all been widely adopted? Has someone put it up on the board? We position ourselves, as we described, just behind the press of the board. We want to pick up best practice when it starts to be adopted and people understand how it can be applied. We don't want to be the one who's setting out sitting there in the front of the way where the way crashes on the road. So we want to make sure that we are reflecting what is what is good and, and understanding where it is going, rather than trying to position ourselves right at the front edge of developments. And that's, there's practical reasons for that. The research and development that often goes into many parts of our standard is very complex and many, in many cases takes at least to mature. And we want to see that to have occurred before we look to pick it up in our standard. Because in, in such cases, the risk of unintended consequences would be quite high. But there are situations where we do make changes. And this is one that I think is probably particularly worth highlighting here in Peru. Um, some time ago, um, there, was a, there was a concern or a question raised about the best way to, to manage fisheries um, when they have a really pivotal role in an ecosystem. And I think that this is, this is quite important in many, many locations around the world, many productive systems, but it's probably more, more important in Peru than, than almost anywhere else. That you have these spots where they are potentially quite important to the ecosystem. And therefore, the scientists who, who have worked on these populations identified that we needed to take appropriate steps to manage them to ensure that the ecosystem was able to withstand the fishing impact that was occurring. That didn't necessarily mean that we could fish on them or that we had to fish on them in a very wide manner. We needed to understand the system and establish an appropriate level of harvest given the way that system works. Given that, this led to a revision of it in our standard to incorporate this idea of key low trophic level requirements. These were to try to pick up the really specific fisheries 
we were also concerned that it would form the pivotal role in the ecosystem. And without better information, we would need to be precautionary. In many cases, the fisheries to which this applies now do have better information. And so as a result, they're able to manage differently. But this was coming up with a default, coming up with a rule of thumb that was safe and ensured the fishery was sustainable. So over three years, there was extensive consultation and research to understand the most appropriate management approach. So it was quite a long piece of work. And this then led to the incorporation of these requirements. I'll give you just a bit of a hint of, of what they entail. I won't go through them in an awful lot of detail. But for a start, the NFC elected to distinguish between chemotrophic level stocks and non chemotrophic level stocks. This was about focusing on those, those, those stocks that were most critical, rather than necessarily having a broad brush for all fisheries around the world. It was trying to make it quite specific. And that in part arose because of the research that was done to develop these requirements applied to a very small set of fisheries. It was a, it was a narrowly defined set of fisheries that they looked at. What they identified was that there were situations where higher management requirements, in this case I've used a very shorthand description of it, but basically halving the exploitation rate that you would normally undertake on a fishery to, to reach MSY, you would halve that for these fisheries, but it would only apply to these chemotrophic level stocks. So because that's quite a big change in the management, the criteria had to be robust to understand which fisheries this test would apply to. And what came from it was a clear identification that it was related to connectivity uh, in the food web. You're looking for these species or these stocks that are most pivotal to the entire ecosystem, leading to high parity dependency. A significant proportion of energy transfer. So this is the part of the ecosystem that is potentially pivotal for ensuring that predators can receive the energy that they need to persist. And another particular, slightly um, academically minded description is this notion of a lost wasted ecosystem. It's where it all goes through like a bottleneck. And that bottleneck, that point that we, if you have species there, they are quite important because there really isn't an alternative means to convey the energy through that system to the predators. So for those particular systems, it was identified that unless you had better information, you should be considering this management approach. But as I, as I mentioned before, in many situations, people do have better information. They understand the energy flows through their particular ecosystem. They're able to document that, and they can come up with reference points to manage to and ensure that that system is still maintained. The intent here is not to say how much you can fish, the intent is to say the system is healthy. And I think if that's the goal, if you can demonstrate it through another way, then from the MSC's perspective, you're meeting the intent of our requirements. So that's the particular case study that I thought might be of interest, but I'm more than happy to talk about that when we come to questions at the end. I think it's also important to think about when you're setting a global standard, how you address the fact that you're trying to apply this approach across the world to all sorts of fisheries, and you're trying to maintain scientific credibility and rigor that can apply at that scale or that scale. It's a real challenge for us actually having systems that can be applied at all these different levels. The way that we've intended to do that is to give a significant amount of discretion in our standard and train our assessment team members well so they understand how to apply it. Because it is very hard to come up with something that covers that and that and actually have a sensible set of rules that doesn't turn into a very, very long document. Our requirements are currently over 500 pages, so it's a very detailed document to begin with, but actually trying to address every fishery in the world becomes impossible if you're that specific. So one of the ways that we have come up with though to address this difference in scale, and the fact that some fisheries need to have different levels, or they have different levels of data, and they may not be able to collect data, 
data because they simply got all the wire, etc. They can't collect certain information. Was to come up with some risk-based approaches, particularly our risk-based framework. This was intended to provide a mechanism for people to explore and assess data for the fisheries, but do so in a way that was proportionate. So it wasn't assuming that an absence of information was an absence of impact. It assumes in the absence of information that there may be an impact and therefore your score must be lower. When you get the information, your score can raise. And so it incentivizes the collection of information, but also means that small scale fisheries can enter the program with this approach. And right now we've had 67 fisheries have been certified using the RBF. And, and about a quarter of those were in the global south. So this is, a, this is an approach that we have found can be quite successful. It involves a lot of stakeholders contributing as part of the assessment process. When we last updated our fisheries standard back in 2014, there were a number of changes that took place. And those changes included stronger protection for habitats, in particular this issue of vulnerable marine ecosystems, a more precautionary approach to bycatch mitigation, and we also introduced a peer review college. And I think it's important to highlight that. It's, a, it's not a step in the, in, the, in the standard, but it's the process by which fisheries get assessed. We now have independent peer review conducted of all the assessment reports. So this means expertise from outside the assessment team is involved in the assessment process. So you can have more confidence that your assessment team understand the fishery and are assessing it appropriately. Because these changes took place in 2014, but fisheries had a time to adapt to a revised standard, they had at least three years before they were required to put in place a new standard. We only had a relatively small proportion of our fisheries moved to our most recent version of the standard, about 50 fisheries so far. But we're already seeing stronger protection of habitats. So this change that came in place to reflect the way that the world's the science and the management can move on around the world has then been picked up and we've now found a number of fisheries are having to adopt measures to address this revised standard. And in many cases that's resulted in environmental um, performance improvements. So in particular in Iceland, a number of areas there have had to improve their management of benefit habitats. So that's how the role of science feeds into our the fishery standard and how we've seen it then follow on. But there's also a key role of science in individual fishery assessments. Um, and those assessments, are put in, they, they require information in order to be robust. Um, so I think it's important to realise that the specifics of an individual fishery doing work that, that can help inform that is still something that contributes an awful lot to potentially ESC certification. Perhaps we should start out and step back a tiny bit and say, what is a fishery? Um, fisheries assessment, so that imply that we, we know exactly what we're talking about. Um, for anyone who's been involved in fisheries knows that actually defining what you're talking about as a fishery is actually quite complicated. The way that the MSC does this is we define what's called a unit of assessment. And the unit of assessment has several components. It includes the target stock, it includes the gears, the practices, the fleets involved in it, potentially other eligible fishers that may be able to use the label down the track if they so desire, but are not formally part of the assessment, and potentially also specific fishing seasons and or areas. These are kind of the features that you can list when you're defining what your fishery is. The year of certification that eventually reaches the cert certificate at the end of the process is, has all of those features but tends to focus primarily on the target stock and the fishing method or year and practice. And it may have other eligible fishers that sit outside that. So here, that fisher is one of the other eligible fishers that could choose to use the label but doesn't necessarily have to be part of the original assessment. The reason why this matters is because it gives flexibility for someone to seek certification for a small portion of the activity that takes place. So it might just be a few vessels decide that they want to seek certification. 
Maybe they sell to a different market. Maybe they have a, a different buyer in mind. And for them, certification is potentially something that would be useful. So because of that, they can seek certification in advance of the others that are operating in the fishery. But if the others that operate in the fishery later on wish to join, they can. They just might need to ensure that they have the appropriate traceability and systems to be part of that. But the intent is that the MSC program is flexible enough to allow for industry to choose exactly how it gets involved. The assessment process. I won't go through this in great detail, but suffice it to say that the assessment process itself is detailed and there's a lot of opportunity for the input of science. It includes a full assessment, potentially you can come up with your own assessment tree, your, your own version of the standard, if you find that your, your version, the default version of the standard doesn't apply to your fishery. You gather the information, you conduct this client and peer review once the report is, is produced, then you publish the report and stakeholders can provide comment. There's also an important other aspect of this too, is that fisheries can be objected to. So we have a form of appeal that can take place. So fisheries, there's a final right of appeal to eminent, an, an eminent legal person who we have independent in, ad, adjudicators who undertake those evaluations and that form of appeal sits at the very end of the process. So the science actually feeds in particularly at the peer review stage, but also stakeholders. Stakeholders are really important in this process. They might be aware of information that we're not aware of and be able to bring that to the table to ensure that we're fully considering that or the assessment team is fully considering that. How do they score these fisheries? We have an, we have an intriguing scoring system that has evolved over time um, that basically in, considers that it's analogous to the way that you would pass or fail if you're at university, possibly. Um, we have this notion of a minimum acceptable threshold. You must meet that threshold for every individual component of the standard. But overall, you must also then, if you, if you only meet 60, you must improve. You, must, you will attract a condition. And a conditional pass is only allowed to persist for one certificate, so five years. You must have closed that condition. Our expectation is that all fisheries, on average, reach the best practice level of 80. They can have a number of conditions, but their average must still be 80. And over the life of the certificate, they must close those conditions. So this means that a fishery that might have particular impacts on a bycatch species, but does very well with its habitats management, can still seek certification, but over the first period of time, it will have to work to improve its bycatch. So it gives this incentive for improvement, which is a key part of the MSC program. And eventually, fisheries can continue on and move up here, and we see some fisheries now scoring quite highly on average. Fisheries that have been in the program for some time are scoring above 90s in a, on average in some situations. And that reflects the fact that they're scoring hundreds for some components because they're managing things very well. So with the 400 certified fisheries since 2000, I mentioned the, the figure before, but the part that I didn't highlight was, was this little thing here. We've had over 1,200 improvements, and this is, the, this is the scale of the program, the fact that now we're finding that all these fisheries that are in the program, if they receive a conditional pass, they'll need to take a step to improve some aspect of their performance. And now 1,200 fisheries around the world have had to make those improvements. Often that includes gathering new information, it might be improving their management. I'll go through a couple of examples. So in terms of protecting habitats, there are a number of different forms of action that have taken place. A lot of it has been focused on research. It's about being un understanding what their, their footprint is on, on the seabed and things like that, or mapping the habitats that they find there. There's also been technical actions, there have been spatial closures that have been put in place. There's been all sorts of other management measures to mitigate the impact on the environment. So that's about 13% of fisheries in the program have made improvements associated with habitats. In terms of bycatch, 60 fisheries have made improvements to their practices here. And what we find is that those improvements are across a wide range of species. Many of them are to do with reducing fish bycatch, but we also have 
significant numbers of fisheries where they're also reducing their bird, sharks, whale and dolphin bycatch as well. And they're having to make these steps to make improvements. Often there's a component of this where they're assessing the impact and in other situations they're modifying their gear. So the examples that we have here, um, I won't go through them in detail, but haddock, toothfish, squat lobster and rock lobster. The Chilean squat lobster is probably one that's, that's worth highlighting actually. Um, introducing different nets has made a big difference here in terms of the level of bycatch and also minimising disturbance of the seafloor. These are the kind of steps that people, when there's an incentive to improve, they can pick those up and it helps to ensure that the management of the fishery becomes more sustainable over time. And they maintain compliance with the MSC standard and they continue to use the eco label. The other thing that's happened too with many of these fisheries is they've improved their stock status. Um, in many regions of the world, stocks show higher biomass after MSC certification. And that's, that's important for several different reasons. One of the most fundamental ones for a fishery is that that probably makes your life an awful lot easier. Your catch per unit effort is probably going to be higher if you're maintaining your stock in a healthy status. But there's also other really interesting indirect benefits that result from this. The amount of fuel you use, the, the fuel you use goes down. So we found this in Iceland. There's actually been a reduction in the amount of fishing effort that those, those vessels have had to undertake to catch the level that they're catching. That's a way of contributing to reducing your carbon footprint, for example. Things like that can be a direct consequence of managing your stocks better. And a final example that I think is probably one of our most famous ones. This is a, a fishery that we've talked about around the world because it is one of our biggest success stories. The South African hate fishery. This fishery seeking certification involved a a huge amount of improvement being necessary. It was right on the cusp when it walked in. But when it came in, it has made massive improvements. Seabird bycatch there has dropped by over 95%. And because of that, it makes a huge difference to the, to the populations that are affected. So that, in terms of the environmental impacts, that's been massive. And largely it's been driven by things like using Tory lines and better management practices on the vessels. Because of the fact that it was certified, it also had a socioeconomic impact, and I will touch on this a little bit later, but it helped ensure that the processing jobs that were based in South Africa were able to stay in South Africa because there was a market for processed fish. Now that's incredibly important to the local community. It led to something like 12,000 jobs in that particular area being safeguarded. So, the notion of a trade-off between high performance and economics, sometimes you can get both, and often you can. Um, I think this has been some, one of our big success stories. There are others I've obviously mentioned, but I, I like highlighting that one. What's next for the MSC? So we've talked about how the standard, that how the standard has come to be and, and the science that sits within it, and how science is applied at the level of individual fishery assessments. But there's many fisheries out there that are not yet in the MSC program and many other parts of the world where MSC has not yet had a significant influence on the way that they manage their fisheries. So what we are focused on is moving more into the global south, these areas that are further afield from the traditional areas where MSC has tended to have certified fisheries. And we're trying to find ways to incentivise improvement there. The recent UN FAO report on the state of the world fisheries highlighted that sustainability is increasing in developed world fisheries, but overall sustainable fish stocks as a proportion are still declining because in the, develop, in the developing world it is still going in the wrong direction. And I think this speaks to the fact that we now have different challenges to address. And for the MSC's mission and vision, our, our focus must necessarily switch to deal with some of these, these bigger challenges. So what we have uh, in the past, we, where we've been heavily focused in the US and various other locations in Europe, you can see these clear performance indicators of, the, of stocks improving. So 74% of USA stocks were sustainable. Um, 
over ten, that's a ten year, over 10 years the increase of over 20 percent. Um, those kind of big changes, they're astonishing, but that's probably not where the biggest challenges now lie. So what do we do about these other parts of the world? We've been undertaking a number of other projects to try to understand how those fisheries in, in, the, in the further away parts of the world from Europe um, might actually be involved in the program or indeed assess their sustainability and determine what they would like to do. There's been pre-assessments to help identify and understand the performance of fisheries in many parts of the world. There's been work in Mexico, there's been work in the Mediterranean, South Africa, Madagascar, Indonesia, India, Western Australia as well. We're trying to understand in these areas what these fisheries performance is like, so that we, if there are potentially candidate fisheries with a link to a market, they may well be able to be certified and that performance recognised. And it's not just about that individual fishery, it's about catalyzing improvement in that region. We find that when we get above about 20% of a particular area, of a particular product class certified, all of a sudden the market demand and the market drive kicks in. And that results in this desire for improvement. And as that happens, then the the, the fisheries that had never even been approached start coming forward and then we can start to see these improvements continue on. We've been supporting small scale fisheries in the developing south. We've recently had a, a significant grant from the Dutch postcode lottery, I think it was nearly 2 million euros, um, that has gone towards trying to assess these fisheries, particularly the Indonesian, South African and Mexican fisheries. And it's all about trying to make these improvements. We also have our Global Sustainability Fund. So we as an organisation, the MSC, donates a significant amount to helping incentivise improvements. So this is a, primarily, it's a research fund, but it's also potentially for capacity building as well. And we've recently done some donations on this, including in Chile. And as I mentioned before, this issue of socioeconomic impacts, this is an area that is of increasing importance, understanding the consequences of certification for communities and what the benefits can be for those communities. So we're undertaking research now in partnership with um, a number of different universities in the hope of actually understanding what the benefits are of this and how we can increase them further. So with that then, that's, that's a sense of where we're going next in terms of our, our presence more widely. But pulling back to the issue of the fisheries standard and the pivotal role of science and of stakeholder engagement. I wanted to just flag that we're about to embark on a fisheries standard review. We released our last standard in 2014. So we're now coming up to that point in time in our cycle where we need to reconsider our standard as well. We need to review it. Our Board of Trustees is actually quite specific on this. We need to review, but we may not necessarily actually decide to change the standard unless we have good evidence that suggests that something has changed. There has been new science that has emerged. There's best practice that's been adopted by management agencies. Those kind of things, that's what we're looking for in our review. So the fisheries program documents, and forgive me for those who, who were at the workshop because this might be a little bit of a repeat, but the fisheries program documents, we basically have two parts to them. We have a certification process which says how an assessment needs to be undertaken, and then we have our standard which is what it's being assessed against. This is the bar. This is what, what is the level of performance we expect. So the review is business as usual. As I mentioned, it happens every five years. It's, it's one of the tools we can use to address concerns. It's probably the big thing that I want to flag. For those who actually have been involved in any processes before with the MSC, I hope you've seen that the way that we, we value stakeholder feedback, but also more importantly, we want to try to get this right because it is so pivotal to our program. So having mentioned that and also flagged, a review does not necessarily mean that we revise. I think we can move on to this, which is our timeline. Reviewing the standard is quite a long process. It's a very complex document. The scientific information that sits behind it takes a while to compile. 
So we've actually allowed ourselves quite a long time to review the document. We're already in the process. We've been going now for quite some time. But in January 2020, our Board of Trustees will make a decision as to whether the standard needs to be revised. And at that point, then the standard will change and that we will consult on what those changes look like. Following that, if the standard does change, there will be a, an implementation time period. So any fishery that's currently in the MSC program will have time to adapt. And that's important because we don't want fisheries to fall out of the program just because the bar might have changed. We want them to be able to improve and reach the bar where it is now set. The objectives of the standard review are to reduce the complexity of our standard. As I mentioned, it's over 500 pages. It's not exactly a simple document. And we want to make sure it's something that can be applied in all fisheries around the world. We want to make sure it's applicable and accessible. We've identified here that if this is crucial for the Global South, but I also just want to flag this issue of priority large marine ecosystems. We've identified through a research process that the areas around the world where it's most critical for MSC to be engaged, these tend to be the tropics and upwelling systems that are productive, biodiverse, or both. And they, they tend to be the systems in which if MSC were to have an influence, it had, would have the best consequences in terms of ocean health. So those are the areas that we want to see our standard being applied. It doesn't necessarily mean they need to be part of the MSC program, but we would like to see those fisheries improve because that's, that will result in a better outcome for the environment. We want to ensure that we improve our data collection. We're actually going to try to integrate our standard into a, a more comprehensive digital platform that makes it easier for people to assess fisheries, but also to make that information more widely available and the data from this can then be shared more widely. We want to be able to make it easier for people to use that information themselves. We've got to work to ensure that our program maintains its credibility and legitimacy. This program is voluntary. It relies on the trust of others. It relies on people ex ex understanding how their feedback is reflected and seeing that reflected and trusting that the end product actually does fairly reflect what is sustainable. So we need to work to maintain that. And we need to follow, this is our particular advice from our board of trustees, the threshold that must be met before the bar shifts. We incorporate improved scientific, scientific understanding and fishery management best practice into the standard. It needs to have both elements. It can't just be a new piece of research. It can't just be a management agency. You need to see both. It has to be practical and based on evidence. What we're looking at is trying to improve the efficiency of the standard so that we get a sustainable outcome with a simpler standard. We want to improve the effectiveness so we achieve a sustainable outcome more consistently. And then finally, we need to evolve in certain areas to ensure the bar is set appropriately to achieve those sustainable outcomes. And that's, that's the goal, and that's the way that we've structured our standard review, so we're looking at each one of these components. I want to highlight this last one in particular because this is often where people are concerned. They see that potentially the bar might rise, and I understand that concern, it's, it's fair. The topics that we've identified that we know that we need to look at in our standard are uh, ETP species, ecosystems, primary species, particularly where the catch that comprise the, um, the target species catch does not comprise the majority of the fishing target activity. Principle three, so the fisheries management system, and finally species strategies for species that have not actually necessarily been well represented in the program to date. What this reflects are the areas where we think that we need to target our work most clearly. The stand, this is a, a relatively small fraction of the standard as a whole, but it is a significant amount of work to actually understand each one of these where best practice currently sits. And in part, the way that we've come to the conclusion that we need to look at this is stakeholders, fisheries, management agencies have come to us and said, these things don't quite fit with our understanding of the way we should be operating. So we want to actually go away, do the work, research that and understand it, and then come back.
how we've got to this point. We have many different ways that we've sourced this information. So the MSC has an issue log where we record. Every time a stakeholder raises something, it's recorded. We also have a process that MSC undertakes to review the fishery assessment reports. The MSC team, my members of my team, review those reports to ensure that they're delivering the standard as we intend it. And we've noticed in some situations, maybe the assessments haven't quite got it right. So for that reason, there are issues with maybe how clear our standard is. There's also results from our monitoring and evaluation, literature reviews, situations where people keep asking us questions about how we should interpret a particular part of the standard. The objections that I mentioned, where someone can appeal a particular fishery assessment, often they relate to not a very clear understanding of part of the standard. Um, accreditation Services International, who oversees the people that conduct the assessments, they might tell us there's a particular area that assessors aren't necessarily understanding. And finally, we have expert findings. My, members of my team are involved in various research projects around the world, various working groups, and we're trying to stay on top of what is actually happening in many of these different areas. But as I've said, and I've said it quite a bit, but I think it's really important, there'll be many opportunities for stakeholders to get involved in this. So if people have a particular area that they think we need to investigate or something that they think needs to be improved, do let us know. I would just highlight, for those that are interested, this address here, msc.org slash FSR. That's where you can go to register as a stakeholder for the standard review. If you have an interest in this, then you can then register and be involved in the process as it unfolds. We're going to be holding more workshops too. We recently held the, the workshop here to talk about principle two, but on the strength of questions and, and requests that have already been put to us, I think we'll be coming back soon. And maybe we'll be looking at other aspects of our standards so people can understand that. But also to talk more about this standard review so people can understand how best to be involved in it. So, summing up, our, our strategy over the next while is to prioritise those parts of the world, the species and markets, where we can have the most significant impact on the health of our oceans. We, as an organisation, want to see oceans improve. And so that's our mechanism for doing that. Our vision remains the same. And our goal for the strategy is to increase the proportional, proportional marine catch that is certified. So what we're actually hoping to see is a measure of success of, of the work that we're doing is that over time, the number of MSC certified fisheries increase and the performance of the ocean in those areas also improves. So with that, thank you very much. Muy bien. Muy buena tu presentación. Cómo evaluar con los índices de sostenibilidad, el, el análisis del ciclo de vida marina puede relacionarse, relacionarse con la certificación, de so, desarrollar una evaluación de sostenibilidad más amplia. Muy buena la pregunta. Hemos tenido personas que han diferentes maneras o dimensiones de sostenibilidad que se consideren el estándar. Hemos tratado de enfocarnos en las partes de las actividades de las pesqueras que, que han sido importantes para asegurar eh, la sostenibilidad de los stocks target objetivo y de las especies que están ahí. Lo hacemos porque ha sido la mejor cosa de mejorar para tener un océano sostenible, sostenible. Esta es nuestra prioridad. Hemos preguntas que se nos hacen sobre hay un rol tratar con la huella de carburo, carbono perdón, en las evaluaciones. Hay, hay razones y para mencionarles, algunas pesqueras ven mejoras en, en la huella de carbono manejando mejor sus Stops. Una de las maneras que puede contribuir el MSC es para alentar a, la, a las pesqueras que lo hagan de manera sostenible. De ahí pueden reducir la huella de carbono relacionada con las PTBs. 
y también el eco labeling, o sea, el etiquetado eco, donde la gente mira y discrimina debido a esa característica. No hay, hay un, la huella y el análisis del ciclo de vida es algo que los consumidores quieren pa pagar y que tienen acceso al mercado. Por ejemplo, en Australia es carbono neutral porque compran los carbon offsets, las conversaciones de carbono. Están en pocos eh, comercios, pero yo pienso que para nosotros es una manera de a, analogía de la cresta de la ola. Es algo que está evolucionando y no ha regado el punto que el MSC es que ha adoptado ampliamente y por eso vamos a incorporarlo dentro del estándar. Hay otra parte, es que los reguladores tienen un rol importante en las emisiones de carbono y parece ser ha sido priorizado por muchas de las personas porque tiene que ver con el aire limpio, pero el sentido del mercado es de utilidad. Yo creo que este, este tema tiene que ser eh, tocado por los, por los gobiernos. Eh, usted ha mencionado que una de las escribías que se está, que está en proceso ¿no? de certificación es la de Juez Chileno, la de Juez de Chile. El de Juez es una especie personal. Eh, eso significaría que la certificación tenía, tenía que ser de todo el mundo, o sea, no solamente el de Juez que se encuentra eh, alguna vez en Chile. Como es una especie transnacional, pues esa certificación tendría que ser también nacional. O sea, tendría que abarcar eh, el QE que está eh, gestionado por la OEO de Pacífico Sur. ¿Es así la cosa o cómo se está llevando esa certificación de, de Chile? Por otro lado, que los mercados de productos biológicos son más exigentes cada vez la necesidad de esta certificación podría dar unos ejemplos en qué mercados hay más esta exigencia Stop lower, 
or if it's something that we need to improve, it can be a condition. But in many cases, managing a large proportion of the stock can still result in a sustained drought. We have seen this in a number of different conditions. It also creates an incentive because if part of the stock is certified, if the stock is certified, other fishers operating on that stock know that they can pass P1. They just need to make sure they're managing their environmental impacts and ensure that their management system is robust in their jurisdiction, and then they can potentially pass an assessment to them. Um, in that situation, Peruvian fishers that are operating on the same stock, they probably have a little bit of an advantage because they know that that part of the fishery could potentially pass. Es verdad que ustedes en el fondo manejan su zona económica exclusiva en, en forma independiente, pero aún con eso ustedes se mantienen y participan, son signatarios de, de la ORP del Pacífico Sur. Por lo tanto, todo el proceso se facilitó, eh, se facilitó mucho más. Eh, eso desde el lado de... tienes toda la razón. Y acá es bastante mejor porque esta, esta organización está encargada del manejo de, de la pesquería. Eh, respecto a los incentivos, ¿por qué la pesquería de Jurel entró a la certificación? Eh, existen varios en realidad. Eh, yo creo que uno muy importante es un tema de imagen. En definitiva, la pesca, todo, todos sabemos, está expuesta constantemente a, eh, a escrutinio público. Por lo tanto, era un interés general de, del gremio de Zona Pesca, que es como la SNP de, de Perú, de, de, de demostrar que su pesquería eh, tenía niveles de sostenibilidad razonable. Eso es un elemento muy importante que no tiene que ver con temas comerciales. ¿sí? Era muy importante para ellos probar eh, que, que hacían bien las cosas. Sin perjuicio de eso, además, eh, esta pesquería tiene un 30% que va a harina. Y ustedes saben que nosotros tenemos una industria salmonera muy importante por lo tanto, ahí hay una mirada estratégica en términos de cubrir eh, las necesidades de harina de la industria salmonera chilena eh, con porciones de esta, de, de esta harina. Era algo bastante importante y adicionalmente eh, la industria quiere eh, potenciar la comercialización del producto, si bien no son mercados sensibles a NSC, quiere potenciar la comercialización del producto Purel de forma internacional. Esas son las razones por qué ingresaron al proceso. Usted habló de incrementar la aplicabilidad del estándar en grandes ecosistemas marinos. Yo quería pedir más detalles y en todo caso preguntar si esto significa dar mayor flexibilidad a los criterios para evaluar las especies de bajo nivel trófico, porque los grandes ecosistemas marinos, por lo menos los cuatro más grandes, están sujetos a una alta variabilidad climática. Y esto no está contemplado en el estándar. En todo caso, quería preguntarles sobre esto. I think that's probably one of the key things that I will be taking back to my, on my visit to the group is this question as to what level of information is appropriate um, or necessary in order to manage a fishery consistent with our And to do so, given the fact that Peru obviously has developed approaches to dealing with this, that I'm not entirely sure if they would fit the gap of the requirements, um, but I know that they are probably close. Um, so there's a question, if you like, as to whether our, our standard is set in a way that is um, that is reflecting what best practices around the world to address that issue. Um, I think probably the best way to, to look at it, um, we, we've, we've started answering the question, if you like, of, of whether our ecosystem requirements need major revision by, through our, our research process to date. And what it has highlighted is that very few fisheries actually currently achieve um, certification with a condition on the ecosystems. Most fisheries pass unconditionally. And what that might be suggesting is that our ecosystem requirements are not actually resulting in 
the improvements for existing certified fisheries because in order to get to the point of seeking certification, fisheries have had to manage ecosystem impacts earlier on in the process. So maybe we're finding that those, those things are happening with FIPS, for example. Because of that, we don't have a good understanding of the information that I've seen today as to whether the current ecosystem requirements are resulting in our intent being delivered perfectly. I think it's pretty good, but I think there's parts we can improve. So that's why we're going to review it. What I would hope is that we could um, potentially convene a meeting here to discuss that in more detail. Because the, the low traffic level requirements were drafted with um, the presence and the input of scientists who consider a wide range of scenarios. But I'm not sure if all of the information that Peru might have was necessarily available to them at the time that they did. And it may be that there's new information here that is worth considering. So, my suggestion really is. Let's, let's look to organise an opportunity for us to review that in a bit more detail here as part of the fishery standard review. Because I think there are questions that we can want to answer with that. Um, I'm not necessarily saying the standard will change, but I think understanding the particular circumstances here would be very informative so that we can then look and see if the standard is delivering the outcome we expect. And I think there's a, in, in setting a standard, there's always this sense checking aspect of it to make sure that you put, that the bar is placed where people can achieve it and that it delivers the outcome that we would expect of the system. And I think if there's good evidence, for example, that the Peruvian, or the, the, the system here that is, is the ecosystem here, is delivering a high level of performance. Your, if the species are maintaining robust populations, if, if there's all those features and a different level of harvest, that may suggest that you can look at that. It's those kind of questions. I think in all of this, the incentive is for people to, to conduct the, the research and put their, their science on the table so that we can talk about it. And I think that will be really your evaluation of Angevetta has come to the conclusion that it doesn't necessarily meet two of the three requirements as, as would be required to trigger low trophic level classification or clean low trophic level classification. Um, that's an evaluation under the MSC, that evaluation must be performed by the assessment team to determine if those requirements apply. So if you have a analysis to support that, that's exactly what you would need to provide to the assessment team to support them making a final determination that it didn't apply. Um, but in any event, it, whether it is chelotrophic or not, makes a big difference to the default performance expected and the default reference points. What isn't necessarily, um, maybe, maybe it isn't as clear as it, as it might be, but in our standard, our expectation is that those defaults only apply if you don't have better information. So if you have good information that enables you to demonstrate that the performance of the environmental system is still sustainable with a different level of harvest, then you could make a, an argument that your reference points don't necessarily have to be the same as the default. Um, the crucial thing here would be potentially an ecosystem model that integrated all of the relevant components to demonstrate that the level of harvest still resulted in maintaining viable predator populations, for example. Um, and the fact that we found that there are these other alternative sources of prey, that would be indicative of a system that should be resilient to a high level of harvest. 
because of the fact that predators can switch from one prey source to another. The challenge in some situations you find that ecosystem models will, can consider this is that not all prey are equal. Some have better nutritional content, some have like, higher lipid content and things like that, and that can make a, a big difference that not all fish are the same in the sense of all the predators. So provided your model somehow accounted for that, and it wasn't just that they can switch from one to the other, but there is sort of a, no recognition of the difference that that prey might have, you could well make an argument that a reference might be different. And people have done this. People have put forward ecosystem models when they enter the system to explain why they think that their ecosystem can be managed differently. Um, I think the other aspect in this system that is quite complex and will probably benefit from being part of that would be the dynamics of El Nino and the, uh, the other sort of longer oscillations because those dynamics have a very critical effect on your catch and provided they're accounted for such that your predators are not unable to find appropriate levels of resources in those low periods, um, then I think you can again make an argument that your reference points might be appropriate. These are things that have come up in other fisheries, and I think it's, so it's not, it, it's a special case with Peru, but it's not entirely unique. Um, Canada fisheries on Peru have had to deal with this. They've had particular concerns about the effect of removals of Peru adjacent to predator populations of, of penguins. They've had particular concerns also about the fluctuations in violence and the flux as it moves through different areas. And their mechanism for dealing with that was to be very precautionary in their catch rate. But with more information, you can be less precautionary. And I think that's that's the hope that the NSC stated, is that you are rewarded for collecting better information because you can then manage and potentially harvest more because you understand the risks better. And I think that's that would be my hope is that the information you put forward can explain how those risks are being addressed by the management system. And I think that's that's one of the six fifteen we can do. So I think the, the notion of maybe us discussing this further in a in a subsequent meeting I think would be useful. I, ideally I would I would probably like to bring members of our technical advisory board who are involved in coming up with some of these original requirements because I think I would like their expertise as well to look at some of these situations. I think it would be helpful for us to make sure that the, the information that's being collected and evaluated is getting us close to what we would, would need to, to, uh, to see in order to be able to say that that's still delivering our ¿Cuáles han sido las soluciones que ha, que ha recibido, considerando que esto es voluntario? Eh, otra pregunta es, eh, en cuanto a la, a la certificación de la anchoreta, es un recurso muy importante para nuestro país. Eh, ¿Qué avances se tienen al respecto? Considerando que, eh, eh, dado la magnitud del stock que tenemos, eh, este recurso eh, eh, también es compartido, un historia en el sur, en otro país. Además que eh, este recurso, la recuperación es en cuanto a este recurso, eh, es separado tanto para consumo ano directo, hablando de la harina, harina de pescado y de aceite de pescado, y las rotaciones eh, para consumo ano, humano directo, cuando hablamos de conservas congelado y otros. ¿Qué recomendaciones daría usted ¿no? para lograr la certificación de The NSC doesn't, doesn't distinguish between the different uses of a product after it is harvested. So the difference between a fishery that is for fish meal or for human consumption is not a, 
It's not a factor in seeking certification. You can seek certification in others. Um, the difference I think that would be relevant to an assessment is if the fisheries operate differently. So if you had, if your fishery for human consumption was, say, more small scale in its operation, and it had different practices on the boats, and it might potentially have different levels of observation or different levels of monitoring at both sides, those things will become more relevant for the assessment team to understand if that fishery is able to meet the NSC level of performance. Um, so the actual use of the that, that's that's up to those who are involved in the fishery. The NSC is a restricted model. Um, when it comes to the issue of the straddling stocks or the, or the adjacent stocks, um, the the MSC standard, not unlike what we just discussed with Jack Mackle, it is possible for you to seek certification of a portion of, of the activity that occurs on stock, but you must still assess the overall stock status in the group, which means that if there is Anchoveta in neighbouring areas, that would need to be considered as a part of the assessment by a a certification body if it was assessing the Peruvian fishery to ensure that the impact of the Peruvian fishery wasn't having a negative consequence across the entirety of the stock. So all of this, the stock health must be assessed at the largest, the broadest possible scale. And that's, that's the way the NEC has applied its logic elsewhere. Um, but having said that, it may be that you can make a very strong argument that with good information and careful management in your zone, the impact of the overall stock is still well managed. And that's where we come back to the example of Chile and uh, Jack Mack. By managing what they were doing in their area in Sprifmo, that maintains a level of control over the fishery that means that P1 can potentially be passed. It's, so, so the whole stock needs to be considered, but the particulars of the local fishery are very influential in how P1 still is.